I like to welcome our uh, panelists. Uh, so this session is on, uh, you know, uh, Indian startups and uh, global investors. So we have with us our uh, esteemed set of panelists. And I want to begin with, uh, you know, asking uh, what makes, uh, you know, uh, why global investors are uh, bullish on Indian startups? So, uh, yeah. So I think uh, if you look at, I think uh, the world is looking at India today and I think uh, there's a lot of talk around that. But if you look at it technically, right, uh, India's GDP growth rate over the last three quarters, right, uh, from Q1 to Q3 FY24 has been averaging around 8%. Right? Uh, this quarter will be around a little over 7% from a growth rate perspective. right? And these are indicators which are allowing investors to not only put in capital but also grow their teams. So over the last 24 months you would see a lot of uh, investors setting up their shops here wanting to invest, understand the market and I think whether it is uh, European, Japanese or even Middle East, Middle Eastern investors, earlier they were LPs, today they want to invest directly. So I think uh, earlier it was the flavor of this season, now they realize they, for you to invest in a market like India, you have to Indianize the way you invest is what I would say. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, I think global investors would definitely be interested to invest in India for multiple reasons. I think we're going to speak for ourselves. Um, so, I've been investing a lot in Europe and Africa for the past period. Um, in Africa, however, we have noticed that some Indian startups are scaling to Africa, but in a way by which they want to sell, either sell their technology to African companies, either, um, you know, kind of like put a base or JV with African companies. What you have noticed is that India is a huge consumer market. I think everybody knows this. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's the largest population in the world currently. What I like to think about it, just like other VCs in Africa so far, is that we tend to say that Africa is going along the way of India. It's like 15 years behind. That's true and not true because, for example, Africa has 54 countries and they're all separate and they all have their own political problems. It's easier to scale in India definitely than to scale in Africa. Uh, we've noticed that India has a lot of corporate backing. For example, I can see that a lot of people have, you know, smartphones. They can use smartphones. When you go to Africa, internet penetration is very low. Even mobile penetration is very low. So we tend to compare it somehow, like same experience, same macroeconomics, but at the same time, it's really different. However, what we really wanted to do is for African companies to use the experience that Indian entrepreneurs had. Um, as a case in point, we had like in 2019, which is, you know, 2021 is also the boom, we had 10 unicorns in Africa. Here in India, I think it's more than 100. And we really wanted to support by which we can take, you know, some of the companies with JV with African companies so that, you know, so the learning effect would be big. And we don't think there's any startup around the world, either US or Europe or any developed market would be able to impact Africa as if the Indian ones. This is basically why we're interested to invest here and really help them to scale. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I mean, as he was mentioning, um, there are a few reasons why the world is looking at India. I mean, it's also called, uh, folks like to call it India's decade. Uh, one is obviously, it's, you know, the fastest growing major economy with real growth rates above 6.5 percent and so on. And that will continue over the next, uh, hopefully, next decade. Uh, so that's one big reason, right? Uh, the second is India's demographic advantage, right? We are the youngest major nation in the world, notwithstanding me over here on the stage. Uh, and our working, and we will continue to add people to the workforce for the next two decades. No other country can say that, right? So we are adding over a million youth every month to the job market, right? So we are in a, in a, a uniquely sweet spot of uh, having built, that's the, so, so one is, as I said, it's a fastest growing major economy, has a demographic dividend. Third is in the last decade or so, and this cuts across both the administrations, we built a very enviable, what's called DPI, digital public infrastructure, starting with Aadhaar, 
you know, UPI, ONDC, the health stack, and so on. And that has really made a very significant impact, and it's still early days, in enabling hundreds of millions of Indian citizens to participate in the economic life of the country. And not just that, also have startups build viable business models at scale on that stack, right? The third very important reason why uh, investors are very keen on India is because of the China plus one strategy, because of the macro environment that is, and, and the global geopolitical environment uh, that is unfolding in the world today. Uh, almost every major company in Europe or, or America or elsewhere is looking at other places to at least have an alternative beyond China, right? And China, India is not the only country. There are other economies like Vietnam and Mexico which will benefit from it. But India is one of the small handful of countries which will benefit tremendously, which stands to benefit tremendously from the China plus one strategy. And what India has in its favor, in addition, to, is, is that it has a very large domestic consumer economy as well, right? So it's not just manufacturing for the world, the ability to manufacture for the world, but also for the large domestic economy here. So about four or five macro points uh, that, that, that are really, you know, quite non-controversial and everybody in the world sees that, which is why there is significant interest across the world in India today. Uh, you know, I think my friends uh, have already covered most of the macro terms, so I don't have much to add on that. Maybe I think one point I'd add is, I think it's the shift in culture that is very, very visible. India is now a startup nation, right? Um, from, you know, anybody through everybody, you know, literally two years ago, uh, one of a, a driver who used to work with us moved out of the job because he wanted to go into a business of fish trading. Uh, I've been pitched by a guy who drives auto rickshaws. Uh, I've been pitched on metros. Um, startup and building a business is aspirational in India. And that is phenomenal because that means as a nation we're going capitalist. We believe in creating value. Our aspirations are there at, with the moon, right? And we're literally building space tech companies, right? We're not just trying to say, yeah, we'll build another social media where, I mean, there's a hundred companies doing that, but there's also 100 companies doing 3D printing of stainless steel, there's companies doing robotics, there's ML, AI, agri-tech, whatever, right? So I think that culture change showcases to the world that our nation is hungry to build value, not just for ourselves, but for everybody, and hungry to build the future actively. And so that means it's an avenue to consume capital as well. So uh, we know uh, like global investors are bullish and for the reasons like you guys mentioned but uh, I uh, want to ask you, you know, uh, can Indian startups scale abroad, you know, to the global markets, your view? Um, so I think there are multiple views, you know, on, on this particular subject, so I can tell you our view, uh, you know, for the past few years. So we have been, you know, in order for us to study how would, for example, African markets or Middle Eastern markets, how would there be more unicorns about, you know, uh, up and coming, we wanted to check the cases for other emerging markets. So we checked Latin America, we also checked South Asia, we checked India particularly on its own. And what we really noticed is that the India kind of went through multiple economic cycles, just like any, anywhere in the world, but we do believe that India was able to kind of overcome each economic cycle in a special way, by which we think that an, as an emerging like a continent, let's say Africa on its own, we do still believe that India would be able to, India status would be able to scale much easier than, for example, Latin America companies or even European, we're not talking to the developed world, you know, than, than other regions. In this case, we also have this assumption that is also, you know, to be confirmed with our colleagues here is that the door to Africa in this case is the Middle East. And we think that's establishing a way, I've already seen a lot of Indian startups having a headquarters in the UAE. And in order to establish also a presence into the Middle East and figure out a way to enter Africa, you know, to enter Africa, we really think that, um, you know, we say that we really like put our expertise into, you know, into, uh, you know, in, into point here and we really want to help them in this way. How we want to help specifically is by investing in them, 
scaling if the company does not have a headquarters in you know in, in, in the Middle East already we would push the headquarters for them in the Middle East and by which we'd be able depending on the sector you know of the company to help them get into Africa and our way that we think would work is basically a JV or an acquisition of you know of current African companies um, you know I can talk about this for hours but I think you know to answer like short answer is yes definitely and I think that Indian companies are even more suitable to scale right now than any other company in the world uh, if you talk about the challenges, you know, what challenges uh, a company, you know, in investment in Indian startups, if you guys want to talk about that. Challenges, challenges. In, in Indian startups. So, I think uh, uh, I can talk from an Indo-Japan perspective. So, uh, the first pitch for an Indian startup is a, uh, is a marketing pitch is what I call it, right? The founder loves to pitch the GMV as revenue. Uh, for an uh, investment professional that is based in Japan, or a Japanese fund, uh, the first pitch is a business pitch. So the difference between the two is a lot and that's where sort of we get issues on compliance, issues on data integrity, issues on the due diligence side of things and that's where at least most deals fall flat, right? So I think these are three sort of critical factors where uh, I think Indian founders need to be uh, slightly more uh, prudent about and they, they need to sort of uh, I would say adhere to international sort of guidelines. There aren't any international guidelines, but in India we say mota moti ye number hai, right? Approximations. So I think we need to lose those approximations. If your revenue is 1.02 million, it's it's 1.02 million. It's not 1.5. It's not one. So, so that's a Japanese perspective because uh, I represent a Japanese fund, but would love to understand what my fellow panelists have to say. What's do you have any? Uh, no, this works. Um, yeah, so problems faced by Indians, I think it's still a largely a matter of access. I think as Indian founders, we don't know, just like there are nuances to pitching to investors from around the world, right? To a Japanese investor, there's a certain way of pitching certain things that they want to learn. To an investor from Saudi Arabia or from the MENA region, there's a different way or different things you want to hear. A European investor wants to hear a different thing and an American investor wants to hear a different thing. I think the largest difference is A, while we're globalized as a nation, our entrepreneur culture is not yet globalized, right? There are still pockets. Every Silicon Valley has a different culture. Miami has a different culture. New York has a different culture. London has a different culture. So because there's no standardization, um, our founders find it tough raising outside. Um, without really understanding that culture. And even if they do, getting access is still an issue if you want to raise from foreign investors. How do you reach out and show legitimacy? Today for foreign investors, the largest signal will be, you know, oh, these founders are IIT, IIM. Because that's what they've heard of all these years, right? That's all they know. Okay, the smartest Indians are IIT, IIM. So even if you're a non-IIT founder, you're not going to be able to signal to a an American investor, listen, I'm, I'm the shit, right? I have something. Because they're looking for signals and they don't know how to evaluate you as well. So I think it will take some time as our ecosystem matures and globally investors learn a lot more about Indian entrepreneurs, about how value is created here and our culture. And there's some more homogenization of culture across ecosystems. We'll definitely see a lot, lot more uh, global capital following in to the country, not just at the later stages, but at the earlier stages too. Surya, so, yeah, you want to yeah, add? I think all these points are very relevant, uh, but I'm not, I wouldn't be too worried because uh, we have come a long way in the last 10 years. The Indian uh, investment ecosystem at different, all stages of the funnel has really matured and br deepened, you know, from friends and family to angels to pre-seed, seed, growth and, and public markets and so on. The, the most uh, interesting development is, is the fact that now the Indian public markets are, are getting ready and, and are more able to absorb uh, the new wave of startups that are, are uh, going to go public over the next few years, not just on the big boards but on the small boards as well. But I think some very good points made here which I would like to reiterate. One is, uh, 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 you know, the fact that there is more to India than just Bangalore and Gurgaon and maybe pockets of Hyderabad and Chennai. Uh, but 
keep in mind that the world over there are a few hubs of entrepreneurship like Silicon Valley or Cambridge, England or, or Tel Aviv, Israel or whatever. But I think it would be good in India's case to, for the, the capital allocators, like at least the domestic ones, if not the international ones, the domestic ones should, should uh, set that example by finding uh, entrepreneurs in Gujarat, in Kerala, in UP, Bihar and elsewhere and, and, and there is no paucity of those, right? Uh, so that's one. And second, I also, I think you made a good point about uh, there is a certain uh, casualness Chalta hai attitude, you know, across the board, which gets reflected in some the way we present our numbers or our story or so forth. Whereas many other cultures, Jap Japan certainly, and and most uh, Germany and some of those other cultures are very buttoned up. You've got to be very clear, you know, disciplined about when you say something, you better mean it. And when you right, so that's very important. And I think again, it's a matter of exposure. It's not a deal, uh, you know, showstopper or something that's going to uh, impact seriously over the next few years. But overall, having just visited uh, uh, Abu Dhabi at a, at a big investor conference, uh, the, the two stories over there were KSA, of course, uh, that's Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is also really very, very keen to build a non-oil economy. Uh, and then the other story that everybody gets is India. Right. So, so again, I'll repeat. This is our decade. This is India's moment in the sun, where it's like a positive, perfect storm. All those things I talked about have come together. You got an entrepreneurial class, young kids who want to fail. Right. <laughs> you don't have kids who want to succeed in IAS. They won't fail in, in in entrepreneurship, which is a great thing. You got capital. You got the tech infrastructure. You got a sound macroeconomic policy, and you've got China plus one. It's very rarely that all these things come together like this. It's India's magic decade, honestly. Um, I, have, I just have a question to my fellow panelists, if it's okay. Um, so as a global investor who does not really have a presence in India yet, uh, I just want to, um, and I'm sure the question is quite complicated, but just the simplest answer possible. Would we expect, if we invest in India, to really kind of invest in a bubble of a startup that would be kind of working in India alone? and not being able to scale somewhere else? Like, are we too optimistic to say that we can pick a startup from India and scale it somewhere? Or is India market big enough to really make a unicorn? I'm sure it is and has, has been already. So, so my view is, as, as you said, look, if you can build a business in India, you can build a business anywhere. It's one of the most value conscious set of customers, whether they're enterprise customers or consumers, right? And, and many folks have found that to their peril. Uh, and so, so the ability to build a sustainable business with sound unit economics and real sustainable profitability, if you can do that in India, you can take it across. In fact, Pierre Omidyar uh, of, of uh, you know, eBay and Omidyar Network used to say, India is the innovation lab of the south, of the global south. And, and so we have a company in our portfolio to your answer. So you, you can build a very large company in India too, just in India, right, and have very good outcomes. But if you build a company here that has applicability across these markets, then you can easily take them there. We have a company in our portfolio called Better Place. Better Place is, a, is India's largest blue-collar work, you know, frontline workforce management platform. Now they are operating in Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, in, and the Gulf, right? We have a family of funds, in addition to the India investments, we invest across the global south. So we invest in LATAM, in uh, Africa, and Southeast Asia. We've got fintech investments like Paymark in, in, right, in Africa. We've got ag tech investments in, in LATAM, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. And we can see that, that you know, there are common problems. If you solve something somewhere, you can learn from other geographies. And if you build something that has scaled up in India, you can easily take it. Nothing is easy in life, right? I mean, I, I mean, I, right? But, but there is the potential of taking it to other geographies is, is very much there. Yeah. I'd like to add on that. Uh, what I'd like to say is I think as humans we, we like structures, right? And I think uh, will it work in India? Will it go abroad? Can we do an Indo-Japan corridor? Can we do an Indo-America corridor? I think uh, there are a lot of companies in India which are testing their products in India, SaaS based products and will eventually only sell in the US. 
uh, there are a lot of Indian companies which will end up getting listed, not take any dime of venture capital and still be very healthy companies. So I would not want to bucket these companies in either or. I think both have equal opportunities and I think uh, running after unicorns is the story of the past. Uh, I think uh, India is far more resilient and the policies of the current uh, uh, government have sort of supported that. And uh, in addition to that, yes, there have been certain, so I won't product place my portfolio here, but yes, there are certain companies which do have applicability and they are able to use the India advantage uh, to build in India but for the world. So yeah, it's possible. Hello. Yeah. Uber's CEO Dara Khosrowsai si said recently, right, that India is the toughest market. But we, we pay a premium. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the it's just cancelled. We pay a premium. They tested the product here. So really? I don't agree to what he said. I mean, but what I'm saying is, I think it was taken out of context. But what he was saying was because we've been able to cut India, we are confident we can do it anywhere in the world, right? Um, if you if you, if you can build in India, India, if you can service an Indian customer yeah. and still make money here, you can build in any other market. Absolutely, because the economics are so tight here, your numbers just work anywhere else. But having said that, I think one thing I would say to global investors is to get an understanding of return profiles because return profiles in India are different from global return profiles. Um, I, you know, we see a lot of foreign funds coming in in India and doing a because they thought, oh, this is an IIT kid is shooting for the moon. We're going to write a $3 million check at a 20 mil post or a 4 million check at a 20 mil post at a pre-seed stage. Because that's standard in the US. That happens, right? But then your outcome, you know, even a 1,000 crore outcome, a revenue outcome in India is a very good outcome, which would lead them to a, you know, what, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 crore revenue uh, valuation. But then that's not going to move mountains for you in your fund, right? So if you expect dollar outcomes, uh, you know, for a dollar fund, then either invest in companies which have dollar revenues and can support dollar valuations, and so India to the US story, or if you want to do India to India stories, then make sure your price sensitivity and ownership is accordingly, right? You pay the right prices, because you can mess it up for the whole market paying US prices or, you know, for India companies, but then the return profile won't work for you, and it kills other investors. So that's, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Yeah, actually, actually, it's an absolutely relevant and excellent point. Okay, my last question to all the panelists. Uh, is there any particular sector that is uh, most appealing to the global investor or you know, any sector specific? See, the, the way uh, we look at the India market and I think even uh, sophisticated global investors uh, uh, also sort of look at it similar. So there is what is called the India One, right, which is the top 70, 80, 90 million, uh, who have been served very well by a lot of startups, a lot of global capital. Then there is this whole rising middle class or middle India or India Two, India Three. You know, there are several monikers, names for that, right, which is that half a billion strong even more maybe, 750 million, right, which is very aspirational, very value conscious, have mobile phones, have used UPI, you know, uh, or want a better life for their families in terms of education, jobs, access to finance, access to affordable healthcare, run SMEs, are SME employees, right? I mean, in India, we've had two waves of tech, uh, I would say, transformation. One was the big enterprise led by Microsoft, IBM, Intel, all of that. Then was consumer tech, you know, the Uber, Sola, Swiggy is based on UPI. The big, the third wave that is waiting to happen is the B2B SME digitization and, and adoption of technology by then, right? We've got 70 million SMEs in this country. Right? Yes. So that's part of that India 2, India 3, right? Mm -hmm. So I think global investors understand this very well. I mean, there are all, all manner of studies done to slice and dice the market in different ways. Mm -hmm. And there's the understanding that there is this top 100 million and then there is the next half a billion, right? So, and, and funds also understand where their strategies are, where their focus areas are and so on and so forth. 
Anybody wants to add on? Can I take questions from the audience? Yeah, I think in our case, at least the, the stage we come in, we come in very early, right? With pre seed first check. So we rather like to see founders showing us the future. So we tend to be very sector agnostic. Uh, even if EdTech is not hot today, if a founder comes to us and we, we just recently in our most recent cohort invest in EdTech company, if they show us a vision which is differentiated, we'll take a bet. Uh, you know, we try to because our timelines are 10 years at least to create any outcomes, right? At the stage we come in, it's going to take 10 years to create any significant business. So you have to focus less on the macro and more on the vision that the founders have. The marketing pitch, as Shahan talks about it, uh, is there a strong marketing pitch here and do they have an insight which can actually work out? Thanks. So I think uh, what I would say is we've been investing in India for the last 12 years. Um, and what we've realized is whichever sector is hot is not a sector to invest in. <laughs> uh, I think uh, cycles have sort of taught us that and uh, investors who are cognizant of capital and IRR and DPI uh, would sort of stick to that. And what I would say here is that while we do know of funds uh, who are sort of sector specific, but they then do have the liberty and the capital base to support that. For funds like ours, which are sort of sector agnostic, we tend to stay away from certain sectors which we do not really understand really well and then focus our strengths on uh, sectors where we feel we can add value uh, both from a sector perspective and also from a long term perspective. So, so just speaking on our behalf, I would say our, our strengths lie in taking company to IPO. Uh, we've done that. We had two IPOs in, in the last year. Uh, there were one on NASDAQ, one on Tokyo Stock Exchange. And I think each investor has its own strength. And I think the founders need to see through which investor works well for them. Uh, so yeah, I think that would be my lay of the land in terms of what sectors we might be keen on. Thank you. I would like uh, if anybody has a question for our panelist. Two. OK. Hi, Tia from Australia. Um, my question is, what influence do you think that global investors are having on Indian investors? Is there anything that is shifting in terms of the perspective? I understand that there's a very Indian way of doing things within India, but my question is, how, does, how is the influence happening the other way? Thank you for your question, but I would say that uh, even as global investors, uh, uh, I, I think we're learning from Indian investors because if you have to raise capital in India uh, for your fund, the return expectation from LPs is very different. Uh, and uh, I think Indians are uh, very adept at sort of uh, multiplying capital uh, through multiple asset classes. So just because you're a global investment firm in India gives you no advantage. Uh, other than the fact that you can sort of open a, a few markets. So talking about Australia, if there's an Indo-Australia sort of partnership that we have uh, on a bilateral sort of, and that can sort of extend on the VC side of things, that might work out for maybe an Australian venture capital firm. I have very limited exposure to Australia, so I would sort of refrain from sort of talking more beyond this point. I hope it answers your question. Yeah, I can, I can add a little bit on that maybe. Um, I think definitely what's changed is founder friendliness. Global capital, so I mean think about it this way, right? In 2000, I think 12, when the Red Bus, Red Bus was one of the first high profile exits that happened. It was a $150 million outcome or exit. It was a big deal in the ecosystem. We were like, wow, a $150 million exit? Oh my God. But with global capital coming in, seeing larger markets, seeing how value investors think about larger opportunities, um, our expectations of return profiles have changed. Um, for like exactly 10 years ago, we had four unicorns. Uh, today we have 104, right? Uh, if 10 years ago you'd ask anybody, can you expect a billion dollar outcome in India? You wouldn't have said yes. But because global capital has come in, uh, it's shown confidence in the economy and it's enabled Indian entrepreneurs to go global as well, right? Um, 
we've realized that larger outcomes are possible. Today we have maybe 10 to 15 Decacons in India, right? So the question is, most funds today will be planning for a billion dollar outcome. But now can funds plan and envision saying 10 years down, we can have more $10 billion outcomes in India? Yes. So that mindset has changed. Our worldview has grown and it's a lot more founder friendly. Earlier investors used to take early stages, 25-30% ownership um, in the first round itself, right? Today the standard tends to be 15-20%. to 20%. Founder term sheets are a lot easier and faster. Um, India now has a safe note, we created it, I, I'll humble brag, but India has a version of the safe note which did not exist earlier. Um, so yeah, we've learned a lot from global investors for sure in thinking larger, in thinking about larger outcomes and um, in making it a lot, the process a lot more founder friendly. I, I would like to add a note of caution though to all of that. All that is true, uh, however, uh, we've also seen that there has been a bit of excess over the last few years and many of those unicorns are struggling to stay unicorns. Um, so over the, at least the next few years we expect that uh, profitability will be valued over growth at all costs, uh, which means that valuations will be saner and, and closer to, to earth than reach uh, unsustainable stratospheric levels. But still, that doesn't mean that you can't have very good outcomes, which goes to your earlier point about entry price, about expectations of outcomes based on, on whether the revenues are dollar revenues or INR revenues or whatever, right? So yes, it's a very attractive market where you can build good businesses, but hopefully over the next few years, the excesses of, of the last, you know, 2021, 19, 20, 21 will work their way out of the system and, and we'll have uh, healthier companies with better unit economics and not chasing growth at all costs. That's very important for a healthy ecosystem. Thank you so much. With that, we will be taking the last question for this afternoon. Please go ahead. Mic check. Hi, this is Paritosh and thank you so much for such a thought-provoking discussion. My question is very fundamental. Uh, we observe that a lot of startup founders these days enter the market with an exit in mind and their chief goal is to just get an exit and get the money and you know exit the market and be financially stable so one how do you look at this trend do you uh, i mean what is uh, what is your interpretation of this trend and if so if there is a founder who wants to enter the field and look for an exit what is it that he or she needs to keep in mind to make a venture which basically fulfills his his dream or his vision i personally would stay away from someone who wants to enter just to get an exit. Obviously, getting an exit is very important for, for everybody in this, right? right? But at least because we are early stage investors, seed and pre-series, we look for guys who are passionate about some problem that they want to solve, okay? And build a large, have a good, you know, good vision of, of what the future can be. Of course, backed by a solid business model, some IP and, and, and the ability to execute and so on and so forth. But anyone who comes in and you hear in the body language and other things that, I, hey, I'm here to get rich quick or, or relatively quick, right. right? Then you should probably go, you know, go to Wall Street and, and, and join some large bank and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm not one of them. Just <laughs> but I'm saying you as in, as in whoever the founder is, right? Want, 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 want the, the resilience, the, because every company will go through a rough patch. Okay, I, I, in my portfolio, I, I mean, I, I uh, advise half a dozen founders to stretch the cash, to reduce burn, to figure out, right? So uh, that kind of resilience, I mean, it, it, what are called, uh, the market today favors what are called cockroach entrepreneurs, who will survive and thrive in the toughest of conditions. Right? Now, somebody who comes in with a, with the dollar symbols in his eyes or her eyes saying that, hey, I need to get a $50 million dollar outcome for myself and that's why I'm building this, we'll run at the first sign of trouble. But I, don't, I don't think that works as in, I've never seen a founder who sort of come out to the market to raise capital with an objective to get an exit, have a very successful outcome. I think most founders who give up the best exit tend to not have exit in their mind. Yeah. 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 
for them it's it's a passion right this is something that i want to do for the next 30 years um yeah i think it it's an you know i don't think it's bad to think about exits um for a first time founder a 10 crore outcome is like wow oh my god my life has changed it's literally life changing money even 5 crores is life changing even 2 crores is life changing but uh, you have to understand that that just doesn't fit into the venture model you're not raising a half a million from them or a 100k from us for a you know for a 10 million dollar exit right or a 10 crore rupees exit right once you're in the venture just basic economics economics suggest that you know we would want you to be an outlier right a 60 70 x multiplier on top of us at the earliest stages at least and future investors a shahan who's a series a would have a much larger outcome expectation and so once you're in venture you are gunning for a 500 mil you know billion dollar outcome because that's the way our business works if it's if that outcome is not possible we can't return money and so we're not investing in you guys right so we're not planning for to invest in like a million dollar outcomes thank you thank you so much but this is just the discussion that goes around and so i thought i'll get your perspective thank you so much for your answer